So welcome, welcome everyone to the Australian Circular Hub, the Circular Economy Hub's last webinar for 2021. It's been an amazing year. Uh, and for those of us who have joined for, for several of our other events, thank you for continuing up to this, uh, to this last event. So, but before I start, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all calling in from today to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm joining from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. And uh, thanks for everyone for popping in the chat uh, where you're from. Feel free to share that uh, with the group. So my name is Dr. Nicole Garifano. I'm the head of circular economy development at the Australian Circular Economy Hub or the ACE Hub as we like to call it. The ACE Hub is funded by the Australian government and our sponsors Bingo Industries, Keep Cup and Planet Art Power. And our mission is to facilitate the transition to a circular economy. Uh, in Australia by providing a platform for knowledge sharing and collaboration. And today is a really great example of, of that knowledge sharing on a really important topic, which we'll get to in a second. So just a quick bit of housekeeping. Don't forget to, uh, or remember to select the gallery view in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, that way you can see everyone. And also if you could please note that this event is being recorded and will be shared uh, on our YouTube channel uh, and on an email uh, in the coming week. Um, the link will be ready for the recording. It'll be, it'll be as part of that email as our follow-up to you and also placed on our ACE Hub website. We have so much to cover in this next 60 minutes. It's very exciting. So uh, let's really get started. I just wanted to introduce first off of a little bit of what the, the concept is that we're talking about today. So today's event really discusses, discusses designing for circularity in the built environment. The built environment is our human made surroundings encompassing everything that we live in, that we work in, that we shop in, to roads and transport networks, even green space design and water systems. So it's a very all encompassing concept. But products and materials found in the built environment tend to have a much longer lifespan than, than perhaps other consumer products such as textiles and packaging. However, the impacts of the built environment products and services can really be quite substantial contributors to, to landfill. So for example, the construction industry, industry alone is responsible for a third of total waste generation. In fact, a total of, of the total construction waste, over 75% that is sent to landfill could in fact be considered reusable materials such as concrete, bricks, timber, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunities there to reconsider the built environment and what we can do with that segment. But particularly, what does this transition to a circular economy mean for the built environment? Well, to discuss this today, our focus is really going to be on that first principle of circular economy, design. And so to design landscapes for circularity and to contribute to what we would like to see as a carbon neutral target or effectively a carbon neutral future, Designers and their use of transdisciplinary thinking could really play an important role. For the built environment, and particularly for the building industry, there are really a lot of lessons that can be learned from that transdisciplinarity across different sectors. So it is this concept of transdisciplinary thinking and design and the ability of this approach to offer alternative pathways by learning across sectors, which is the real focus of today's event. And this event has been developed in collaboration with one of our ACE Hub collaboration partners, Deakin University. So our speakers will argue that it is fundamentally crucial to expand our approach to circular innovation for materials or products to one that adopts a very much an ecosystem perspective. And it's really to look at reimagining the built environment as a catalyst to a really circular society. So to guide us through these foundations of design, the role of designers, the need for transdisciplinary uh, approaches to research and practice, we're going to hear first from Professor Tuba Kujaturk. Professor Kujaturk is a professor of integral design and the founding director of the Mediated Intelligence in Design Research Lab at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at Deakin University. Tuba is also the founding co-director of Design Mind, Deakin University's design and innovation platform, and is currently representing the university on Geelong's UNESCO City of Design Committee. She's also registered, she's a registered architect and holds a PhD degree in architecture and building technology from Delft University of Technology. 
Welcome Tuba and thank you for your contribution to bringing today's event to life. Thank you, Joining Nicole. My, yeah, no problem. Joining Tuba in our discussion later on is Joanne Kellogg. Joanne is the CEO of the Design Institute of Australia. She has a background in fashion and textiles and is a strong advocate for the, for the designer's role in the circular economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her knowledge of the clothing and textile supply chain combined with recent leadership of designers working in interior product, communication and textile design have really given her a, an excellent, unique perspective on building effective transdisciplinary teams. And thanks to you, Joanne, for joining us today as well. And our third guest for the discussion is John Gertzakis. John is a director of the Australian Product Stewardship Centre for Excellence an adjunct professor with the Institute of Sustainable Futures at UTS, and is co-founder of the E-Waste Watch Institute. John's policy, stewardship and design project engagements cover appliances, electronics, office furniture, floor coverings, textiles, plastic products, a big range of products. So it's really fantastic that you're able to join us as well today, John. Thanks so much for your time. So today we've got a full schedule, as I said, uh, for our event. Uh, so to get us started, I'm going to pass over to Tuba for her presentation to introduce the session. Over to you, Tuba. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nicole. I'm going to be sharing my um, screen. Is that okay? Yep. Yep. Um, just putting it in. Yep. That's excellent. Yep. Perfect. All right. Super. Thank you. Um, well, uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be connecting with you today. Um, thanks to Nicole, Medi, Planet Arc family and the AC Hub for inviting me here. And thanks to John and Joanne also for joining. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a subject which everybody is already talking about all the time. So I guess the, the challenge is rather making it maybe a little bit delightful and what better ways of making something delightful than talking about design. So I'll try to cover a number of key and I think critical aspects around design, system thinking, and closing the social loop in circular cities. Let's start with the definition of the built environment. So built environment is as old as humankind and includes man-made building and infrastructure stocks which constitute the physical, natural, economic, social, and cultural capital. It also is composed of different scales, could be buildings, neighborhoods, cities, regions, and each with different time constants, actors, and institutional regimes. And as Nicole already pointed out, today the building operations consume vast amounts of natural resources, roughly 40% of all materials globally, and roughly 40% of all carbon emissions, while generating 35% of all the world's waste, or which most is being landfilled. So this is mainly due to the fact that building industry mostly adopted a linear economic model for decades, which is defined as the take, make, and dispose model. It's also important to note that the waste we generate in building industry is not merely attributed to materials, we also waste spaces, energy, and by sending 54% of demolition materials to landfill, we fail to exploit the inherent economic value embedded in those materials. Over the past decades, a paradigm shift has been occurring in the industry at large with the adoption of a circular economy model, which aims at keeping materials in a closed loop to retain their maximum value. And here, instead of a linear flow of materials, the C promotes, the circular economy promotes a circular flow of materials, which reduces the environmental impact and ideally to maximize resource efficiency. I'm not going to dwell too long on this because since you're all here, you already know about the background, but I would like to emphasize the big question or the big answer that we're all seeking actively as built environment professionals, architects, researchers, and designers, is how to drive and implement a circular transition for the built environment. I'm sure you're already familiar with different versions of this butterfly diagram from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey, um, which 
kind of explains the principles of the closed loop system concept of the circular economy. As brilliant as it looks and as it sounds with all the potential that it exhibits, there are a number of unknowns and missing links in this diagram, which are yet to be discovered. The natural and the man-made world that we are living in are not simply constructs of material flows. A fair distribution of social value is not by any means guaranteed through keeping materials in closed loops. So we really have to integrate these concepts into the building blocks of enabling practices, business models, legislations, and so on. An alternative and complementary view would be to shift towards an understanding of how social and cultural value can be connected to these two biological and technical systems. Here, the cultural capital is defined as cultural values, beliefs, knowledge, and skills that are embedded in a society. They are obtained from previous generations. And when we talk about natural capital, referring to renewable and non-renewable resources, they are the precondition and basis for the cultural capital. So, and human-made capital is generated through an interaction between the natural and cultural capital. Therefore, human-made capital is never value neutral. We need to understand these dynamics to obtain collective benefits. I'd like to continue with two key propositions. The first one is that a circular built environment is not simply a sum of circular buildings and infrastructures. And the second one is circularity is the property of a system. The built environment is an integral part of the ecosystem and the metaphor of the city as ecosystem or as an urban metabolism really provide us with a deeper understanding of these up and downstream impacts of circular flows. Also, when we look deeper into the urban metabolism and analyze it, it helps us understand the dynamic flow patterns, not only materials, but also behaviors, energy, and so on. And it gives us an overview of where the urban system is malfunctioning and identify maybe possible opportunities. And by doing this, we can clearly see the biggest areas for innovation and through engagement with local stakeholders, solutions can be not just created, but co-created, co-designed and co-produced in an ideal world. However, we really, it's really important to, to understand that circular economy is is not just a complicated system as majority of our educational systems try to see majority of our problems today. Circular economy is a complex and adaptive system. So let's recap the key differences between a complicated and complex system. So complicated systems have multiple components, as you see on the, on the left, which are joined together in quite predictable and deterministic ways like an internal combustion engine the behavior of the system can be explained through a simple cause and effect relationship. However, complex systems, although they also have multiple components, the components of a complex system interact in unpredictable ways. When you make a small change in one part of the system, you may create a dramatic impact on another part. The interactions and relationships of components simultaneously affect and are shaped by the system. We can create complicated systems easily by first designing and engineering its parts, and then by putting them together and voila, you have a complicated system. However, we cannot build a complex system from, uh, from scratch and expect it to turn out exactly in the way that we intended, because the components in the system co-evolve through relationships with other components. Similarly, we can often fix easily a complicated system by fixing one or more of its components. However, in a truly complex system, there is no solution. The way to achieve progress is to create high quality and constructive interventions to bring the whole system forward in a more desired state. And design today is becoming an invaluable means to identify these interventions to deal with the complex ecological spatial and social challenges that the built environment is a part of and partly responsible for. When we look at what's going on at the moment in terms of how design and circularity is being associated, 
we see that the majority of the current work focuses on the idea of designing out waste and designing buildings and components with transformation and reuse potential. The diagram on the left, for example, shows the most explored concepts for circular material use in construction, focusing on designing for multiple lives of an individual building, such as design for reuse, design for reconfiguring, design for recycling, and so on. And each one bringing or aiming to bring a different value at a different stage of the life cycle. The figure on the right depicts the reversible building concept, which is also highly popular, and which is defined as a process of transforming buildings or dismantling its systems, products, and elements without causing any damage. And reversible building design is currently recognized as a key accelerator of circular economy in construction. I'd like to explore more about the role design can play for circular innovation beyond an individual building or a product. So that the, the value is not limited to creating a new product or a service alone for an individual building, but the value might be used to drive new business and ecosystem innovation. And in this wider perspective of circular innovation, it's, it's important to quote Simon Widmer, who points out, we need to use the design approach to support systemic change on a cross industry level, bringing stakeholders together around a positive vision and in order to meet the challenges involved in sustainable living. The design process can help to look at the system as a whole and identify intervention points for systemic change. But how do we innovate through an ecosystem perspective? How is it different than the way we used to innovate in the past? We actually have a number of useful precedents in recent history. And in this slide, I would like to show you um, how our understanding of innovation change from a product focused perspective to a system focused perspective. When you look at some of the biggest innovations of this century, the 21st century, the first thing we notice is how we change the way we frame our value propositions from products to systems and the role design has placed in this transformation. Today, we're not just designing telephones, right, as products alone, but we frame them, we reframe them as mobile communication devices, which we design with the ability to connect to other devices, to be compatible with other applications, services, triggering new business models, experiences, and with social and economic impact. And similarly, we're not just designing cars anymore, but urban mobility systems. Again, they result in completely new interactions between cars, people, and the environment. This systemic approach helps us realize our capacity to innovate beyond the boundaries of any individual sector or discipline. So the value of design really has been expanding from designing things to designing things, interactions, experiences, business models with and within and for a system. The question is what this implies for the built environment and whether the circular transition of the built environment could be considered through this systemic perspective. Although cities only occupy 3% of global land surface, they consume 75% of global resources, and they produce 60 to 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. When I first heard about that, I was, I was really shocked. So th there's a huge effort across the globe to transition our cities to more circular, ecologically and socially integrated hubs. This is arguably one of the most essential steps in our transition or envisaged transition uh, of our human society into a more sustainable state. The circular cities is a relatively new concept and it offers a workable framework to adopt and integrate circular built environment concept at a system level. In the following slides, I will showcase um, some of the examples that I have been reviewing over the past few months of a number of circular city initiatives across the globe, including how circular building 
and circular neighborhood concepts have been developed, designed and executed in different cities and in different, different city contexts. Although the transformation is happening stagnantly, there are inspiring examples demonstrating the potential. And before I move on to the case studies, I would like to point out that um, although each circular city is different because each city is different, there are some common characteristics of circular cities, um, such as collaborative efforts, a lot of experimentation, co-creation, cross-sector symbiosis, and the local community involvement. The first example is from, um, from Holland, uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, this building is called the Circle. Um, it's almost like a landmark in Amsterdam's Zeudas district. It's created by the Dutch bank ABN Amro, a building designed and constructed according to a maximum sustainable and circular principles and circular business models, according to the bank. The pavilion is designed and operates as a living lab, and that's the really most interesting part, where various city stakeholders, businesses, entrepreneurs, and researchers come together to test different circular solutions. It could be from hospitality sector to thermal energy generation and so on. The pavilion also houses a circular economy pop-up shop, exhibitions, workshops, and lectures. The idea is to use the building as a showcase for circular entrepreneurs and as a stimulating space to forge new partnerships, product and business innovations. And I really like the slogan used for this building where they say it's not about copyright, but about the right to copy. Uh, here in this uh, cross section, uh, you can see a number of different approaches adopted by the circular building. Um, through the use of various recycled and repurposed waste materials, which are not only coming from the construction sector, but also from other sectors like jeans, for example, used as insulation material. The building has also adopted a number of circular business models. For example, the adoption of non-toxic bio-based raw materials as circular inputs that are renewable or can be reused. Also lifetime extension approach has been adopted through the use of smart tools which kind of prompt the facility managers about when to maintain, repair, and upgrade. Through the use of sharing platforms, um, they can monitor and combat underutilization and optimize the use of different assets in the building. And additionally, product as a service business model has been implemented throughout the building, including the lighting, the lifts, and the use of AV services. The secret success in such projects lie not just in the technical details, but also in the process, ABN AMRO project manager tells, which means the people. Circular design and construction requires creativity and collaboration, obviously, but not just in the traditional building trade, but across the sectors. An interesting learning from this building is that the sector partners can seize far more opportunities by adding value at different points in the process, entering into new partnerships and investigating different business models. Here, the diagram shared by the project uh, partners provides a reflection on what has been learned through this building circular journey, indicating which circular business models provide which opportunities and for different sector players. And an interesting reflection, one of the project partners was as the following, where he said, we need to get away from agreeing and defining everything in advance in contracts. Let's leave the risks with the party that is best able to bear them and create new opportunities. The next um, example, again, um, in uh, Amsterdam, but this is a completely different section of Amsterdam. Uh, it's called, the project is called the Schoonskip which is a prototypical resilient and circular city neighborhood uh, project co-developed by the architectural firm Space and Matter together with the local community. So it's basically compo is composed of 44 floating households in Amsterdam. The project is known to be a very successful example of circular neighborhood for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was initiated and developed not by a developer, 
but by a group of enthusiasts with a shared dream, how to build a sustainable close-knit community on the water. The scope of the project was quite broad in the beginning, ranging from ideas and targets about energy, material management to socioeconomic development of the, the area and human well-being. This breadth was essential to maintain a systemic and integrated approach, not just the design of the building for reuse. There are a number of things which I think really pushes the, the current boundaries of circularity and community governance and resilient urban development. For example, the community shares a blockchain-based smart grid through which they can trade solar energy amongst the households. There are in total 500 photovoltaic solar panels which produce energy for the whole community and every household has a battery in which the energy can be stored. Each floating house can be plugged into a central jetty which contains the technical infrastructure and which is also creating a smart network of the dwellings around the jetty. So each house is also connected to a heat energy recovery system, has a green roof and wastewater system. I, I, what I find quite interesting is that the community which has envisioned and created this neighborhood, neighborhood is now working with other neighborhoods in Amsterdam, sharing and offering their experience to other communities. This is an example from the city of Prague. The Circular City Prague is a relatively new project. And I wanted to share with you how they started the circular city planning and what were the different um, steps of that process. I thought it was a really useful example to showcase the very complex journey, uh, but at the same time, the importance of collaboration and coordination between the local government, businesses, technologies and resources. So the whole circular city project started with a circle city scan. A circle city scan is actually was designed to reveal where opportunities lie for the circular economy in the specific context of Prague. The process of executing the scan depended highly on a collaborative and multi-stakeholder approach. The outcome was a visual roadmap, which identify opportunities to foster a number of circular innovations. So the scan was basically composed of three phases. The first one was the socioeconomic agenda, which provided insights into the strengths and challenges of the local economy. And they kind of identified which focus areas held the greatest transformative potential. Based on this analysis, and together with a consortium of local stakeholders, three priority sectors had been identified as construction, household, and utilities. There were other sectors that have been examined as well, but the scoring of each sector's performance was based on three high level indicators, the added value, jobs, and greenhouse gas emissions. The material flow analysis as shown on the left diagram, it provided insights into the magnitude and the nature of flows of materials and products which run through the flow into the city. And this kind of helped identify high impact material flows and opportunities. And here you see they've done it for different um, housing typologies and including infrastructure, non-residential buildings and residential buildings. Together with a group of experts and local businesses, the immediate action plan for construction sector was decided as the development of a circular tendering criteria. And with public sector influencing almost a quarter of construction activities in the city, it was decided that there was a great opportunity to leverage public procurement through incorporating circular principles within the tendering process. Circular procurement is increasingly being adopted by cities throughout Europe and beyond. They are really serving as an inspiration and highlighting the potential benefits or, of circular procurement, such as the requirement of the use of reuse bricks, um, in renovation projects in the city of Copenhagen. And similarly, the stimulation of the market demand in Berlin for recycled concrete use in construction. There are also other opportunities offered by other circular cities. And each one stimulates another form 
an inspiration of collaboration across the city. For example, I thought Blue City is definitely an important one to mention here in the city of Rotterdam. So the interesting point here is that the Rotterdam University of Applied Science has started this project called the Blue City. So an old swimming pool in Rotterdam has been transformed into a research center for circularity, and it became a meeting place between teachers, students, researchers, and entrepreneurs in the city. So this is not only a meeting place, but also an exchange of ideas place. And it is composed of a bio lab, a food lab, a manufacturing lab. And there are currently about 40 entrepreneur, entrepreneurs constantly working on live projects. For example, one of them is Rotters One. You might have heard this one, who are growing oyster mushrooms on coffee grounds. Um, and then there's fr fruit leather. They are trying to transform fruit residue into a leather-like material. And then super use studios working on different waste streams to create new urban ecosystems. And uh, one of my favorites is the perpetual plastic project where a plastic recycling installation is re uh, recycling um, plastic by 3D printing it into new products on the spot. As a last slide, I'd like to share with you um, a brand new initiative that's going on in the European, uh, that was announced very recently by the European Commission. It's called the New European Bauhaus. It is recently started. They've just finished the first stage and, and far from implementation. But I thought this is a very interesting approach which kind of unites and integrates some of the concepts that I've been mentioning in my presentation. So it's called the new European Bauhaus because it's been inspired by the original Bauhaus movement of the early 20th century. You will remember the original historical Bauhaus movement, which emerged at a moment of deep transformation, very similar to what we're going through today. But back then, it was towards the modern societal and industrial era. And the founders back then, they tried to address this transformation in their work, and they tried to search for solutions of the new challenges, and it became quickly a global cultural movement. And the idea with the new European Bauhaus is to establish something similar as a combined environmental, economic, and cultural project to enable the transitioning into a more circular and sustainable future. And like 100 years ago, the question again is innovative materials, which is the key point in this transformation. While at the same time, um, while, sorry, uh, the previous solution was to use the cement and steel in the best way possible, we are now exploring nature-based materials that are produced sustainably. So the triangle you see here on the left is uh, what has been announced as the three core inseparable values um, to be adopted, which are a combination of sustainability, beauty, and in togetherness or inclusion. And um, from the reports I have gathered so far, um, the three key principles emerging from a co-creation process are defined as combination of global and local dimensions, local participation and global participation and transdisciplinarity. And this marks actually the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Chiba. Wow, I, that was spot on right on time. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think there are some real gems. I was writing down uh, the statistics that you were sharing around the contribution initially of what the built environment um, you know, has to, to material consumption, emissions, et cetera. Um, and now we've got some noise in our building. Isn't that just timely? Um, <laughs> I also was quite astonished, as you mentioned, you were about um, the... An, percentage of global resources that city consume, cities consume, that's, that's really incredible. But, but seeing those case study examples, really exciting to see that we've got, you know, some in place tangible examples of, of what we can do with regards to circular design in the built environment. 
Um, I'll just add a quick note. We had, um, you mentioned the city scan for Prague, I think, uh, yeah? Yes. So uh, the Hunter region has actually had a city scan done recently. And, and as we were seeing in the chat, um, Mitch kindly shared the link. They're launching the results of that finding on Monday, but there will Excellent. be... Um, some more information shared on that. So uh, they did have to do a few um, adaptations to the original tool, but um, still a very useful process to be undertaking. So, yeah, thank you. I'll, um, I'll just invite um, Joanne and John to come back uh, to the conversation. Uh, we've got a few questions that we're going to discuss now with um, taking on this concept of, of transdisciplinar transdisciplinarity. Um, so the first question that I have probably uh, for John and Joanne, um, in your sectors, how, how have design and systemic thinking shaped the circular innovations in the places that you work in? So, um, well, from my point of view, we're across an, an organisation across all the disciplines. And I think some of the things we need to factor in here are the life cycles of products like fashion, for instance, has a much shorter turnaround time than something like um, a house or an interiors, the external building. And then we used to look at trends and how they filter across the industries. And the last one to get the trend was automotive. And that still, in essence, has a big impact on how um, the circular economy is embraced by those different sectors. Um, in fashion, there's been a lot of particularly media coverage around uh, post-consumer use, waste, we've all seen it on the TV. Um, what isn't always um, broadcast and televised is around the early stage manufacturing and the work done in materiality and applying waste and reuse to those parts. And we often think that that's um, sometimes an earlier um, starting point where people can get some quick wins. And so I think those things actually drive the adoption of in, across the disciplines of what the uptake is. Um, mm. I could go into more detail. But yeah, okay. Thanks, Joanne. We might just jump to John and come back to some of your details in the next, in the follow-up questions. Thanks, what about Nicole. you, John? Thanks, Joe. First, I've got to say thanks to Tuba for a fantastic and refreshing uh, uh, presentation. It's always great to hear um, some uh, some you know, deeper reference to system wide thinking uh, when we're talking about circularity. So thanks. Look, one of the things to note, and it's a little bit dry, but it, it is nonetheless really important that you know uh, we now have new legislation in Australia, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Act, and for the first time, the objects of that act are calling out design. They're talking to design. And, and the importance of it being front and center in, in the transition to a circular economy. So um, that legislation and the subsequent regulations are in part drivers for how we might see that, uh, that change take place. Um, getting more specific and, and in, in the space that I work in, I suppose, around extended producer responsibility and product stewardship and also um, design projects, trying to address circularity and environmental performance and, and these sorts of areas. You know, there are some really good examples there around um, transdisciplinarity, but you know, a very elastic definition of transdisciplinarity. You know, really looking at how um, we apply extended producer responsibility and product stewardship, and someone raised this as a question. These are not new concepts and tools, but how we apply that from the sort of the manufacturing sector and products um, and really translate, transform that into into the built environment. The built environment to a significant degree, not entirely, is made up of a whole lot of small products and materials and all the rest of it. And if you look at EPR and product stewardship, it's an interesting dynamic where we're otherwise competing manufacturers and producers come together to collaborate in terms of better managing uh, their products post-consumer or across the life, life cycle, et cetera. And, and there are some really good examples there, not perfect, but good around the IT sector, the National Television Computer Recycling Scheme, Mobile Muster, Paintback, Tire Stewardship. These are all really good examples of what could be taking place more proactively in building and construction. And some companies are very active in that space uh, in terms of manufactured products in, in, in building and construction but it's still pretty dispersed. So seeing a much stronger stewardship approach into all of those products and materials that go into the built environment, cladding, ceiling tiles, office furniture, floor coverings, resilient flooring, 
all of these areas, doing that in a more systematic way so that we have extended building responsibility uh, beyond the rating tools that we know of today. Um, and the product stewardship is underpinned by those, by those principles and tenants that Tuba is talking about so that we don't reduce stewardship and EPR uh, to just collection and recycling of stuff, which is very important we need to do more of. But there's, there are some good examples there around how industries in other areas, other sectors, more of that could be trans, translated, transformed, mimicked, adjusted uh, to deliver circular outcomes in, in building construction, the built environment more broadly, but to be done with haste and to be yeah. done transparently and to be done uh, in a way that happens across industries and sectors, not isolated global brands that are leading the way. You know, yeah. we really do need to see industry-wide commitment, uh, accountability, responsibility around all of these products and materials that are going into the built environment. Mm. Yeah, great point, um, John. And Joanne, you touched on this as well, that, mm. you know, um, as evidenced in your in your presentation, Tuba, that the built environment is made up of lots of little things, lots of much smaller things. And, and there are some real opportunities there to, to take those learnings, particularly around product stewardship, as you mentioned, John, um, in different sectors and see how that can apply to the built environment. And just a quick note on that, that um, Assistant Minister Trevor Evans is, has currently has an open call for uh, um, identifying sectors or industries or products that might be uh, part of, a, of a, a, a second iteration of product stewardship um, investment for next year. So we can share that link with you as well. Um, yeah, thank you both. I think the next question is really around, and I think Tuba, you might have touched on this already, but why is it so important to embrace the, the cross-sector or transdisciplinary um, circular economy uh, innovation? Why is it so important? Is it because there's so many actors? Is that sort of part of the reason? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we gave our studio prize this year with, at the Good Design Awards to a company called The Growth Drivers, TDG. And they actually have on their website, if you have a look at it, transform your obstacles and opportunities into impact that lasts, right? And I, we were talking to them, we had a sort of a joint hookup and about who's in their team. And so they consider themselves to be a design practice, but in their team, uh, engineers and design thinkers, it's quite a different model for a, what we condition, uh, traditionally see as a practice. And we're seeing that emerging. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday, the prize we gave last year's winner, and they're, they're looking, they're designing in system thinking around financial wellbeing for banks. You know, like, so they're moving into these different spaces. And I think when you look at why is it important, because it's not a simple problem, the issues are complex and you need that collective thinking, cognition to solve the problem. No one individual has the answer. Um, and I think, so therefore we've got to learn all the rules that sit around that. How do we get on? You know, there's tensions in the room, and you know, there's different levels of understanding. How do we manage that? And we actually have to get better at managing that to achieve the responses and the outcomes that we want. That's that human bit is an essential part of it. In that complexity that that Tuba was talking about, it, you know, if we're talking system wide change, redesign, there are some really uncomfortable conversations that have to happen. You know, there's a lot of existing business models that are at threat because their products are either single use, problematic materials non-renewable, et cetera. So I think part of it is that we're, you know, we're really grown up about having some spicy conversations in terms of what's needed to, to transition to a circular economy. So, uh, and that's partly what makes it a really wonderful opportunity. You know, with complexity comes, you know, addressing it comes big rewards in many respects. With sp speaking of transdisciplinarity, one of the greatest quotes that I really love and use at similar occasions is, um, is the following. I, I forgot who said that, but somebody said, real world problems do not know disciplines. And it, it's so true because we create, discipline is a man-made concept. If we're mm -hmm. gonna ever focus on real world problems, we have to forget about those very narrow particular perspectives. I think a very good example is really iPhone. It could be just 
a product, right? But it's also a fashion item. It's a status symbol. It's a communication device. So you can actually own it through the perspective of various different sectors and disciplines. And that's how we create innovation, I suppose. Yeah, and it's also sitting with that unknown. It's uncomfortable um, to sit with the unknown. And to solve these problems, to come together as teams, we need to do the things that build trust, you know, like learn together in a group. What do we need to do to learn together, um, experience things together, do things like little rituals, like have a lunch or all of those things are important when you bring in those the people, those people to the table. Part of it is in identifying it, whether it's in your local community or in your staffing. You know, how do you identify the skill sets and the knowledge that we need to be able to address these issues? Yeah, um, yeah. On a bigger scale. Good points. I think two things that come to mind um, from those comments are, um, well, I think a couple of months ago now, we had a, a webinar with uh, the Hunter Joint Organisation and Edge Environment and also Sustainability Advantage from New South Wales Government. And I remember Jonathan Wood from Sustainability Advantage, one of the key takeaways was, you know, to really get into the circular economy, we need to check our egos at the door. Mm -hmm. and, and I really think that the comment, um, one of the things that you raised too, in your presentation, which was a quote that you said from the circle folks, um, it's not about copyright, but right to copy. And having that, that sort of, as you said, John, those, those grown up conversations about, we actually just have to move forward and we need to be, a lot more collaborative or as Paul Clemenko, our CEO says that the circular economy will require the largest collaboration effort uh, that's ever been you know, considered to be able to really transition to that full circular economy. So, mm -hmm. yeah. John, did you want to add something to that? Look, I, I suppose one of the things that strikes me, and again, it's, don't want to generalize the built environment and companies and businesses there, but I think one thing that needs to happen more effectively is that we need to bring circularity, we need to bring product stewardship, EPR, we need to bring it to the boardroom. Uh, leading companies know it, they're doing it. Um, but, you know, there's all of those medium companies, small companies that supply the big companies. So there really is a need to, to bring these uh, tools, these changes to the boardroom and senior decision makers. I think that's really, really important. And so that's that's less about transdisciplinary, but more about corporate structures and engaging, informing, uh, exciting those that at the end of the day are commissioning and, and appointing mm -hmm. designers and design professionals. Yeah, they are the drivers of where we will get change. Designers in many respects have shown that, that they're open to and already practicing some of this, mm -hmm. but it's those who engage and commission that need to be brought along the journey. And that means really getting it, getting it to the boardroom and getting it to decision makers, as well as all of the middle level practitioners. And that's yeah. not about being hierarchical. It's about acknowledging if we want system wide change, uh, we need those decision makers to be uh, engaged and excited because it's, it, you know, these are new business opportunities with you know, potentially great opportunities to you know, build social capital, economic capital, etc. Yeah, and in the long term too. And I think that really segues nicely into the next question, which is around what are some of the enablers and drivers that, that exist that we need to consider to embed this concept of design-led circular innovation into the built environment? Tuba, what are your thoughts on that? Um, if I had to pick one, I would go for experimentation and this is something mm. we're really missing yes we have funding mechanisms yes we have schemes that we apply for but they are really geared towards finding solutions to very well-defined problems and the examples that i have shared with you today and which i think makes them really interesting is they are all outputs of experimentations and continuous experimentations there's another quote which says we can only design what we can imagine and that imagine has to be expanded and can only be expanded through interaction and trial and error at the same time. Um, and that would be my choice, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great one. What about you, Joanne? What are your thoughts? What's a key enabler or driver? I'll just back up Tuba, and I'm probably one of her greatest fans. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try something that's a little bit drier and close the home and has to do with the hip pocket. And that's um, talking about insurances, which in the construction industry at the moment, are, uh, probably a response to a symptom of what's gone wrong. Um, but they are the fact that 
um, insureds are withdrawing from the market. And our insurer told, it, told me the other day that um, Lloyd's have withdrawn from the Australia market because of the risk. What that's doing is there's dwindling supply, but at the same time, the government is introducing new regulations, putting more accountability because of the cladding issue, the fire, on every single person in the construction supply chain to be accountable for their work. And they need PI insurance, professional indemnity insurance, and it's getting harder and harder to get. And so those people that once upon a time had um, good risks and a good history are now finding it difficult. And that is driving changes in behaviour. And so, but I'm, <laughs> from my point of view, when I see the whole of industry, I say, but that's addressing a symptom. The real problem is lack of compliance and substitution of materials. And that's a border issue and all sorts of other things, specification, currency of knowledge, a range <laughs> of issues that contribute to that. And but as, as a consequence, we saw the terrible fires and we've seen structural damage to buildings. Um, so, yeah. But this is the reality of what we've now got. We've got a movement coming through in changes to state regulation in construction. And we've got the insurances, the insurances upping the ante. So yeah. interesting perspective. Thanks, Joe. What about you, John? What are you, what's your key enabler to get it's this? It's a great going? question. It's a great question because I just think uh, the realist in me tells me we need every possible driver to be activated. That's the realist. If we want circularity across industries, communities, sectors, every possible driver needs to be. The pragmatist in, in me says. We need to get very serious about procurement in this country. We give it, we, we talk to it a lot. It's window dressing. Sometimes it reduces to just you know, recycled content, but procurement can drive so much, uh, whether it's in government, all levels of government, uh, or in, in the business world. So I think procurement is a really important driver and needs to be broadened to, to really suck in the principles of circularity to deliver outcomes. The other one, and I'm gonna be greedy here, is intelligent regulation. We really need to get, we need to grow up about the role of smart regulation, dynamic regulation, not, not, you know, not regulation that is a burden necessarily, but regulation that stimulates innovation to deliver circularity in the built environment, in products and services and so on and so forth. So, you know, procurement and smart regulation are two key drivers that would level the playing field in some respects, but also talk to the, uh, talk to the dollar as well. Yeah, great examples. I think, you know, it, it really does cover off <clears throat> some really interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, um, issues, you know, around exper experimentation, as you were saying, Tuba, that, that we don't, I was speaking to somebody, maybe it was all of you when we were having a chat the other day about the, um, the environment in Australia is quite different to other places in the world in terms of um, failure, where, you know, there's, there's almost a, an environment where if you have many failures in other economies, it's actually almost like a badge of honour, whereas in Australia, um, failure is sort of seen as, you know, somewhat of a, a limitation. So, so, you know, considering that experimentation is needed um, to have um, insurance companies be more confident in, in having some of these experimentations go ahead and to have that procurement and, and smart regulation is a great all-encompassing responses. Thank you all. I guess the last question is, how does one get started on this? If somebody sitting from the, you know, working in the built environment or as a designer, what, what is, you know, the top sort of three, I guess, that we can, um, that we can offer in terms of how we get started on this journey of embedding design-led circular innovation? Um, do you want... I, yeah, go ahead, Joan. Yep. So given that we look after the professionals in the design what I see them grappling with in trying to transform both their businesses and themselves is that you've got legacy issues you've got to deal with, you've got to manage your current service levels, and you've got to introduce the new, and you've got to try and balance that. And that is not an easy task in the middle of a pandemic, mm. let alone at any other time. Um, but someone told me once, if you're trying to climb a mountain, the person who give you, can give you the best hand is the one that's directly above you, not the one that's already at the top. And so what I'm saying, when, when you want to break down these problems to manageable sizes, 
then I think the first thing is to talk amongst your team, look at the resources that you've got at hand. And they say the best way of achieving a good idea is to book an appointment. So go find somebody who's done it in a similar space to you and a bit ahead and go and have a coffee with them. Yeah, great, great advice. Thanks, Joan. What about you, John? I think one of the things is um, is to uh, not have fear of your own ideas, be they small ideas, big ideas, and pursue them with relentless persistence. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there now, uh, whether it's whether it's through the ACE Hub, whether it's through certain industry associations, the Centre of Excellence, there's, there's no shortage of really good resources to sort of help equip you to pursue those, those ideas. But I think a lot of it comes down to just, you know, having the fortitude and the persistence um, to go for it and, and really push hard uh, in this space. As I said, yeah. there's lots of resources. But learning from other industries, as Joe says, those above you, beside you, whatever, learning from other sectors, other industries, what's worked, what hasn't worked, dodging that. Um, but there's no shortage of resources. A lot of it is just, you know, at, you know attitude, approach, you know, relentless persistence in what you yeah. think is necessary. And giving it a go, I guess. Totally. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tuba, what about you? Over to you for the last word of our, of our session, of our discussion um, session. Yeah, I, I completely agree with um, Joanne and John. Um, maybe I'll just say it in a slightly different way, but more or less the same thing. Do not wait for the funding. Do not wait for someone to come and poke you. Just go out there, speak with people and start interacting and sharing ideas. That's, that's a new way of working and researching. We just have to be more interactive and proactive, I suppose. Great. Yeah, great summary. Well, look, we're getting close to time. Um, thank you so much. I know we've got a, a number of questions in the chat and um, uh, Tuba, Joanne and John have kindly agreed to have a look at um, some of the questions to see if we can have some responses to those in the email um, that you'll get next week. Uh, but so with that, I just want to say thank you all. I know that Tuba, you've put a lot of work into your presentation and, and organising today's event, introducing us to Joanne and John again. Um, thank you for, for all of you for your time and choosing to spend your lunchtime with us, uh, sharing all of your valuable insights and really helping us to, to reimagine that built environment as a catalyst to a circular society. Um, so I hope those in the audience, uh, we've given you uh, some of the insights into the importance of design and the critical need to adopt this transdisciplinary approach to being uh, designing in circular innovation. Um, We'll be sending out the link as Lucy's uh, been popping in the in the chat there to the recording and some of the mentioned resources in our follow up email in the coming days. And as this is the last event for, for the year for the ACE Hub, we, we look forward to joining you again uh, next year on, on our webinars. But in the meantime, please visit acehub.org.au to learn more about what the ACE Hub's up to. And, and John's also put the product stewardship link in there, Joanne at the Design Council, and of course at Deakin University with Tuba. So just before we close off, there'll be some questions that'll pop up um, when we get when we close off this webinar. We'd really appreciate your responses to help us design what happens with our program next year. Thanks to Lucy and to Maddie and the ACE Hub team for coordinating this event. And thanks for all of you for joining us as well, for spending your lunchtime with us today. We wish you all the best for the holiday season and um, hope you are able to have a break uh, this year. And, and we look forward to continuing your journey with you on circularity next year. Thanks. Nicole. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, thanks again, Nicole. team. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later.